Well, welcome everyone. Ron Gerber from Angelly. So excited to have Matt Seacall, one of the top sustainability experts at Microsoft. I think this is going to be a real fascinating talk. For those of you who know Angelbeat, we've been working with Microsoft for almost 25 years now. One of the key reasons why Microsoft is so successful today is because of its cloud computing and its ability to provide very power efficient and technologically advanced solutions for organizations to in many cases augment and in certain cases replace their on-prem computing. So as Microsoft has developed those capabilities, they've really had to make the most sustainable, the most energy efficient data centers in the world. And what I would like Matt to discuss is you know, some of his personal background. We know that Microsoft, when it's promoting its own cloud solutions, sustainability is increasingly becoming a key driver for those decisions made by organizations to use their Microsoft Azure services. But I think the most interesting thing that you'll find, and I was wondering this myself, so here's my first question to Matt, is why is Microsoft putting so many talented executives, uh, his exact title is sustainability advocate. Matt isn't selling any Microsoft software or computing solutions. He's just a phenomenal resource to help organizations with their sustainability. So Matt, maybe if you could just share some of your background, some of your experience before you were involved in sustainability, and give us some ideas on your activities, both internally within Microsoft and even more importantly, the role you play in helping organizations accelerate their own sustainability projects. Sure. So thanks thanks for having me first off, Ron. Uh, so my name is Matt Siegel, and I am a worldwide sustainability industry advocate here at Microsoft. And my history is really not necessarily in sustainability. I used to be a long-standing Microsoft customer for about 15 years, had a pretty traditional IT background, went to a Microsoft partner doing largely Office 365 and some cloud migration projects. And then I moved over to Microsoft in the financial services sector. And I quickly found that non-financial services customers at the time, this was four or five years ago, didn't really understand what the financial markets were doing from an ESG and sustainability perspective. And you could argue that this is still even a challenge today. Um, and so I would talk to these non-financial services customers about ESG, about sustainability, what their understandings were, their CSR report, uh, their ESG ratings and metrics from the big data aggregators. And I quickly formed a lot of opinions on this. Um, and I would get pinged from field teams to go talk to different customers. Um, from there, at around the same time, once I got a little bit more mature in this space, maybe like 18 months ago, Microsoft published its big moonshot announcements, our big environmental commitments. And as a result, customers were just pinging our environmental sustainability team to have discussions. Oh my gosh, what does this mean? Microsoft's making these big environmental commitments. How do I do something like this? And so as a result, our environmental sustainability team was just getting inundated with requests to talk to customers about what we're doing, how we could help. And so eventually the pressure built too much. And it kind of was a, a little bit of a distraction from the core work that Microsoft was trying to do in this space. And so they spun out a worldwide sustainability team, which is where I sit. So I have I what I think is one of the most greatest jobs at Microsoft, talking to a broad range of customers across industries about sustainability, about ESG, how technology intersects with those things and can help them make commitments and then meet their commitments to their stakeholders across their ecosystem. So now, that's, just, that's kind of what I do. What a great job. Now, just to clarify, when you talk about the environmental team within Microsoft, those are the individuals actually building out the data centers. Those are the people working on internal projects. And then your role is to help facilitate and transfer that knowledge from that team who's so build, busy making your own facilities more efficient, making your data centers so reliable. You're now taking that knowledge of what Microsoft's done as one of the world's largest corporations and helping transmit that information and users while still helping Microsoft itself meet its own internal commitments. 
Right. That team is really responsible for things like making sure data centers are built sustainably or making sure that the energy runs to them sustainably. They're also, they also do a little bit of product work. Like we have things like the planetary computer, which is attempting to democratize access to planetary scale data sets. You know, there's a scientific group there that runs that effort. Um, there's all sorts of integration that they do across our product teams to make sure that they're thinking about sustainability. So yes, absolutely. They're kind of like our internal operational sustainability engine. And then my job is to kind of take the best practices that they've learned internally um, and apply it to what customers are asking me, you know, around what they need help with. One of the interesting things that we're finding a lot at our Angel Beach seminars is that there are a number of pressures coming from organizations. And it seems to be coming from two major sources. Uh, there is the government pushing organizations. We have the new Inflation Reduction Act, which includes a wide range of government guidelines and government incentives as well. And we see a lot of this support. It's a little bit from a government standpoint, the carrot and the stick. You're going to have to do this. And here's how we're going to help you. The other thing that we're seeing increasingly, maybe you could comment, and I, this is probably why the Microsoft sustainability team recruited you over from the financial services side, what we're seeing is groups like the SEC and corresponding entities in Europe uh, requiring corporations to disclose climate-related risk and climate-related performance criteria as part of their quarterly reporting. And then you've got the investor community looking at these Many people may know BlackRock is the world's largest asset manager, and their CEO is very keen on saying, we're not going to actively hold and purchase your stock if we're not confident of your ESG environmental sustainability goals. And is that what you're seeing a lot, probably, where you can tap into your financial background and help reassure companies, or maybe not so much reassure, but inform them? that you better start thinking about ESG almost as much as you think about profits and other activities, because that's how you're going to be evaluated both as a company and as a shareholder, but increasingly as an employee as part of your annual evaluation. Yeah, that that, that last part is interesting because we are seeing some companies start to tie sustainability to compensation outside of the executive level. But yeah, all of those factors that you mentioned, the regulations, which some are based out of the nationally defined contributions that came out of COP26, um, the SEC and um, the EU Commission's CSRD, which is the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, they're, they're kind of looking to have companies prove that what they're saying about their commitments and goals are actually being executed on. And that means that you're going, if, you know, whatever level you are of employee, whether you're in technology or not, you're going to have to start figuring out how to generate sustainability data around your business's operations and the ecosystem that surrounds it, because your company is going to have to prove that it's doing what it's saying it's doing to not only investors, but also B2B customers, B2C customers, um, other stakeholders, if you have them, if you have um, B2B in your downstream supply chain, like you're going to have to start proving that what you're doing um, is what you're actually doing. And then this this has all sorts of interesting um, byproducts that are largely beneficial, which are giving the markets a different understanding of what you're doing and unlocking lower cost of capital in some in some cases. So that could mean a lower interest rate because you're understanding your ESG risk better around some environmental factor. Um, or it could mean that somebody who's supporting sustainability values is giving you a lower cost of capital because you're driving, you know, a it, climate change impact in a way that aligns with their values. So having part of the challenge though is and this is the conversation that i come to ultimately with customers their technology systems aren't built to surface sustainability data they're built to run the business yeah. and so what we find is it quickly becomes a conversation about digital transformation which we've been talking about for the past decade um modernizing those systems in order to get out quality sustainability information or information that can turn into quality sustainability information is critical but the driver totally what you said yeah. and it's interesting too and i think this touches on 
why Microsoft is such a valuable partner. And that ties in with data collection, because as you mentioned, organizations need verifiable, easily attainable, and most importantly, accurate data to justify this. It's almost like you're getting audited, just like you have, if you're a public company, the auditors will closely scrutinize your financial results to make sure they're true. What we see is companies, let's say you're putting in a whole slew of these 500 foot wind turbines. You need data to justify the reliability of those turbines, maintenance, uh, or similarly, let's say you've got a huge oil natural gas pipeline and you want to make sure that you have very low leakage. How can you monitor pipelines in the middle of nowhere? How do you collect data? Or, you know, similarly, if you're trying to maintain the reliability of the public electrical grid where there's hundreds of thousands of high voltage wiring, how do you monitor that? You know, you just drive, uh, Matt lives in eastern Pennsylvania, and which is, especially if you've driven out there as I have, it's somewhat rural, lots of beautiful forest, but they need power lines that go through there. You know, how can you make sure that those are reliable? And I think that's where we encourage everyone to make sure you follow up with Matt and his team, because not only can provide the insights, but there is some technology that, you know, full disclosure, Microsoft can actually, you know, help uh, provide you with, but it will give you that uh, critically important data to make you look like a star. I'm sure you've made lots of your contacts big heroes because suddenly a sustainability project that let's say someone was just trying to save energy and put in new lights in a factory, it may get under the radar in today's climate. Suddenly, you know, that facility engineer suddenly is reporting up to the executive suite as to what's going on. That's it. That's exactly right. So a lot of the conversations that I'm having for as an example, um, I, I am getting inundated with requests for customers to understand their scope three emissions based on their cloud usage. So I'm talking to a lot of IT and procurement teams, showing them we, we surface this through a tool called the Emissions Impact Dashboard. And I'm walking them through this to say, well, look, here are your workloads. Here's where they're running. Here's where they're running in, you know, very great sustainable data centers. There are areas of the world where renewable energy is very hard to get. Here are those areas. And I can walk them through kind of an understanding of what would make this a more sustainable workload? Is it modernizing it and maybe putting some platform as a service instead of that infrastructure as a service? Is it doing low code, no code, like putting a batch job out there instead of a low server? Is it introducing um, something like DevOps to control and shut down workloads when they're not in use? And then is it even talking to your developers and building sustainable software? Microsoft uh, co-founded the Green Software Foundation, which has this thing called um, the Software Carbon Index that tells developers how sustainable their code is. So even, even like you mentioned earlier, just moving up to the cloud is one way to immediately save carbon, but then there's so many other steps that IT can take. And then at the end of that conversation, I'll typically say, hey, did you know that Microsoft can help you outside of IT yeah. with um, technology solutions across your business to help you get an understanding of your sustainability profile and identify risks that you might not be paying attention to? Yeah, and definitely. then they're like, oh, that would be great. Let me introduce you to so-and-so who's been taught working on this. And it just keeps spinning up from there. Um, and I think you also get the so-called network effect because as Microsoft is so big, has so much insights, Again, from its own internal sustainability, Microsoft has, I don't know how many, hundreds of millions of customers who are all grappling with the same thing. Your team can be a central repository of data. And you know, if you're a sustainability person, you may not think, well, what's the big deal about software where it runs? This is a little bit of an exaggerated case, but look at all the people involved in crypto. Now, crypto has melted down a lot, but I don't think it's going away. One of the key negatives of crypto is that it's incredibly energy inefficient and the power demands created by the crypto industry are phenomenal. Now, we're not encouraging people or not to do crypto. That's your own decision that I'm not involved in. But I think it does illustrate that your choice of technology 
that your software decisions can have a great impact on your energy consumption and your sustainability objectives. And that's when Matt was going through some of these examples here of various technologies. You, you want to make sure if let's say you work in sustainability or she, you're not, you may not be familiar with terms like low code or no code. The point you do want to take away, you're probably familiar with crypto installations totally absorbing the power grid. You're probably familiar with those stories. If you're not, you can Bing it or Google it and you'll find out many of them. Uh, it, it should give you further incentive to understand your whole business and making sure you can make informed decisions. Are there any new things that Microsoft is looking to do in the future as far as its uh, sustainability? I probably look like I remember you said you used to work as an end user. Probably one of the biggest things that Microsoft did with first sustainability initiative when it stopped shrink wrap software sales and did away with CDs. And when you could just do software downloads, that was a big sustainability uh, benefit when you don't have plastic, you don't have shipping, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, well, so we do. We, we've we've really gotten organized um, in the past year or so around this topic. I mean, I'm, I've only been a month in, enrolled for about five months now. Um, and, and we've gotten a laser focus, though, on sustainability. And so we break it out into three buckets. There's kind of the sustainability by default. So when a customer moves to the cloud again, by default, they're moving to not only a data center that has renewable energy, that's only part of it, but a hyperscale cloud provider that's constantly making operational improvements that even if your Azure spend was flat, you should still see your carbon and energy get better over time because we're making improvements on the back end. So that's that's kind of sustainability by default. And then the second thing is we do have some first party products that we're working on. Like I mentioned, the emissions impact dashboard, which is free, the planetary computer, which democratizes access to big planetary data sets. We have a new solution called the cloud for sustainability that is attempting to unify data intelligence around to start specifically carbon activities to help you report your scope one, scope two, and scope three emissions. That's kind of sustainability by desire is what we call it. And then the last one is uh, sustainability by design. And this is where you get a little bit more material to your company and industry, like what's gonna help you solve a particular sustainability challenge. Likely it will need to be something that is built on Azure. It would likely be something that maybe um, like a partner might have built to solve some of the ones that you mentioned, like an IoT sensor to get fugitive emissions or something like that. That is that last pillar, which we call sustainability by design. And frankly, that's kind of the one that excites me the most because it's amazing that we're, we're just starting to see people build really incredible solutions on Azure that I think will go a long way to solving this, this problem. That's great. It's fascinating. I would encourage everyone to follow up with Matt. You can get him on LinkedIn. There's a huge Microsoft sustainability page. If you just do a pretty simple Bing or Google search for sustainability in Microsoft, it'll come up. You can always contact AngelBeat. We can put you in touch with them. You know, the key takeaway why I wanted to make sure we brought Matt to our AngelBeat community is all of you may be aware of what Microsoft is doing with its core business around cloud computing, which has many sustainability benefits just by providing much more energy efficient computing. But that's the real low hanging fruit. And what really is going to drive it is when you take advantage of all these other tools that Matt mentioned, and Microsoft obviously it doesn't sell solar cells or EV charging infrastructure, but they sure as heck can make those platforms work much more efficiently, tie it all together, and it's critically important. And quite honestly, I mean, I'm, I don't work for Microsoft, but you really have to applaud them because they've really tried to make their core business so incredibly powerful and sustainable. And they're also very aggressively making sure that all their customers can do it. Obviously, there's a little bit of self-interest, but they're really doing it because they're one of the good guys. So we really appreciate uh, Matt and his team uh, being part of this. As you can see by those various uh, models in the back, Matt is also clearly a very techie type. So I think he's well-founded. And even though he's been 
a part of the seniority group for a relative short period of time. You don't want to overlook all of his background and understanding the capital markets, the financial industries. And if you're a public company, I guarantee you, whatever your role is, you're going to be facing much more pressure and at the same time have many more opportunities to shine because you're becoming more sustainably aware. I guarantee you, your CEO is going to be increasingly focused on sustainability as much as he, she, or they were focused on profitability in the past. Obviously, you have to make money to do this, but it's going to be incredibly important. And even if you work for a nonprofit, a government, a university, it's all critically important because you've got various stakeholders. You may be looking to raise money. Let's say if you're a big educational institution, you're looking to raise money from donors, they're going to want to ask that. If Again, if you're a university, I guarantee you all the incoming students, they're going to want to make sure that your cafeteria is very sustainable as far as food waste and recycling, you know, how much of the energy is being generated by solar panels on campus. These are all, this is all the new world for all the right reasons. Yeah, definitely. I, I agree. I, I, if I could add one more thing, Ron. Sure. Um, no matter what your skill set is, I think you'll find that, and I'm a perfect example, I think, you can apply your skill set to this challenge, it, especially if you have an understanding. If you're an employee of a company, you clearly have an understanding of that company. Now pivot and take any sort of sustainability class or training or podcast listening that you want, and then start applying that learning to those business challenges. And I think you'll find that you'll really be able to contribute significantly to this problem. It is. And not only contribute to this problem or contribute to solving, solving problem, the problem, right? <laughs> uh, you'll also contribute to your organization's success. And from the viewpoint of personal self-interest, you will also contribute to your own personal career advancement. Again, another thing I can pretty much guarantee. Right. Yep. Excellent. Well, we'll look forward to having Matt when we do sustainability events in the Philadelphia area, join us in person. We encourage everyone to take full advantage of the resources, the capability that Microsoft offers. I hope some of these insights will motivate everyone to start aggressively pursuing their own sustainability projects, be it around clean energy, recycling, wind turbines, solar, EV charging, whatever it might be. You also want to definitely tie in to Matt, me, and ask Microsoft to get involved to ensure that you understand the best practices and that you can take advantage of the tools that Microsoft is creating, as well as their um, almost, I call it a global repository of knowledge, so you're not reinventing the wheel. Yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Matt. 